hold on. Oh, okay, we're recording. Hey. Oh, that was that, so fast. That, that happened fast. Should we record? Okay, yeah. Oh, we're recording right now. Well, because I'm used to, because your mic is fixed somehow, it seems like. So I was, because the last, the other thing we were using for the, that we've been using for the podcast, I have to click like four extra buttons to start the recording and like give yeah. it the, give it a name and everything. But this yeah, one just yeah. goes. Yeah, I'm very happy that it's working. Yeah, me too. So, hey, what's up, YouTube? Hey. hey. It's Paul and Gabe again. I'm Gabe. I'm Paul. And we're from a, a show, a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's called Spine Crackers. Spine Crackers. And we, we do, on the show, we do deep dives, long form discussion and analysis about books, one book a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we also do this YouTube stuff. For the people that, you know, have a shorter attention span, which is lame. Although but, we you know. still go long for a short story. Yes, we do. Um, if you like this video, YouTubers, subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash spinecrackers. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast. Yeah. Subscribe to the YouTube channel that you're currently watching. Yeah. And um, that would be step one. That would be that step one. Start there, YouTube. Get a little insight into Paul's life. He does. He likes to do some uh, videos about his day to day life sometimes, which is great. I do some vlogging on there. I hear there might be a bookshelf tour coming up, Paul. For me? Yeah. Possibly. I think it was, there's, a, there's, a, there's like one book I for, feel like you're really proud of. That you <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah. Anyway, so this series that you're watching is uh, uh, the Murakami Minisodes. Uh, is what we're calling them and we basically are working our way through some of Haruki Murakami's short fiction his short stories and things like that because um we are going to be reading for the podcast coming up Killing Commendatore which is one of his big ass thick boy novels and I you've read some Murakami we've talked about this before but I just wanted to mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, you know uh what's the term I'm looking for like familiarize myself a little more with his stuff his style because i really hadn't read any of his other than norwegian wood which we read together way back in the day and so that's what we're doing yeah we're just learning more reading more learning more about it's murakami. beautiful the world of murakami the murakami verse you might call the it. murakami verse um and so we're starting five minutes ago yeah exactly so we're starting with this book uh men without women which where's your murakami background paul I'm switching it up today. All right. Okay. I, think, I mean, I usually, I, I've been having this uh, background for the podcast, but we don't record the videos and I'm proud of this one. It's my bookshelf, as you can see. You want to just show off. Books. This is a, this is a preview of the bookshelf tour. Yeah. I, as you can see, I stack them in an odd way. I just have to really know the book really well to know which one is which. Any real literary, like any real reader can identify their books if they're stacked that way. Yeah, by the, <laughs> by the pages. They're so familiar with the pages. <laughs> they know them top to bottom. Yes. Um, so Men Without Women, collection of what? Seven stories in here total? Yeah, is this number six? This is we, number, no, no, this is five. There's two more after this, but they're both short. So we'll see. Uh, maybe we'll do, maybe we'll combine them into one discussion. We'll see. But so this is, uh, this is the fifth story. Um, and um, it's called Kino. I think, yeah. I did, did I do the description last time or did you? I think you did. You want to so, take this one? But you I also did, plot I did like the first three. That's true. Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll do it again. Okay. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> We're fine. I get it. We're I get it. Again. I get it. I get it. You We're think I'm not fucking again. pulling my weight right. on this show? You think I'm a lazy bum? No, I don't. Not pulling my weight. And you I'm think I'm be... fat. So Let's take our shirts off. <laughs> <laughs> Can we arm wrestle? <laughs> Zoom arm wrestle. All right. So Kino, um, not like cinema, although I kind of want to talk about why it's called that and if there's any meaning to it. Mm. I don't know if there is, but yeah, it's the name of the character, the main character in the story, and his name's Kino, and he's a, a gentleman. It doesn't really say how old he is, but I, you get the sense that he's kind of in his mid, like middle-aged like he's not a young man. He's probably in his, I don't know, late forties, early fifties, something like that. Yeah. And that's, that's that was my sense. And um, he is, 
just kind of, you know, going along. And he discovers, he basically walks in on his wife cheating on him. He sells, yeah. what was his job? He sold like kind of boutique designer, like um, track, like running shoes, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, which yeah. is interesting, which, because of course, Murakami is a big, is a big runner. And uh, yeah. so there. So maybe this is based on actual <laughs> connections to his personal life. Wow. Right, what you know, you know. <laughs> right, what you know. Running <laughs> shoes and getting cheated on by your wife. Yeah, <laughs> which makes me wonder. It's a lot of wife cheating. There's a lot there of is a, stories. A ton of wife cheating in Murakami in general. Even in no spoilers for the podcast, Killing Commendatore has some wife cheating. I like to think that um, his wife has never cheated. His real life has never cheated on him in real life, but yeah, he's like, sus- like suspecting her for like be, years and he's just writing dark. stories about people cheating on their husbands and she's like reading his stories like uh why'd you write this <laughs> that's a little dark he's like i don't know yeah it is kind of dark but he makes you wonder doesn't he? yeah oh definitely so he finds out his wife's cheating on him and he basically kind of just leaves um packs up his shit and and leaves quits his job and he winds up living with a, a distant aunt who um, had been running a, I think it's a, it was a coffee shop. Is that what it was originally? Do you remember? I think it was a coffee shop. Yeah. Um, and so he essentially takes over, uh, she wants to retire and he takes it over and turns it into a bar, like a little, a little kind of like side street bar. Um, it's in Tokyo, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. he names it Kino. And he names it just after, after himself, himself, which is he, hilarious. He, it's funny also the way he describes it. He's just like, I couldn't think of any other title. <laughs> that, that was the only reason why. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't like he just wanted the bar to be named after him or anything. It's just, uh, okay, Kino, that's my name. I, I, it just makes me think it'd be awesome if there, if there was just ball, like bars just named after us. Like if there was just a, ball, a bar just called Paul. That's I, I told you, right, that there was Gabe. a drink named after me at a, at a bar that's close to mm-hmm. me that I frequented. That's true. Yeah, yeah I saw you, was, you showed me the picture of the specials board. They named it the Sour Patch Paul. It was a very girly drink that I had, <laughs> but I don't care. It's still on the board. Dude, scoreboard. Put it scoreboard. in the win column. Yeah. So one of the biggest accomplishments of my life. Dude, you're not kidding. If I got a drink named <laughs> after me at one of my favorite bars, I would be so happy. Yeah, it was, it was great. I was like, oh, I, I am just amazing and charming. You're right. I can see it. Or you're right. sour. You're like sour and sweet. You're kind of like yeah. both. <laughs> sour and sweet. <laughs> so he opens this bar, um, kind of like a back street, like, like not like a dive bar, basically. A couple, couple chairs, like a couple small like food, food menu items. Um, jazz records. He, like, he loves jazz records, as all Murakami characters basically do, because Murakami loves jazz. And yeah. this, I mean, this is, this story actually does kind of mirror Murakami's life in some ways. And it's like Murakami had a jazz cafe, right? It wasn't like a bar. For years, like yeah. A, yeah. Until, yeah. Until he was like 30, 32 or 30, I think. Right. Before he became a writer. So there's probably, he's probably writing from some experience there. Yeah, um, right, right what you know. Right what you know. Getting cheated <laughs> on by your wife, opening a bar. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he opens the bar and uh there's this kind of mysterious guy that starts coming. This younger mm-hmm. guy, like, you know, he's bald, I think he says, right? Like this kind of like well-groomed kind of guy who comes yeah. and sits down at the end of the bar and reads these big fat books. So he must be a book tuber. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, doesn't say all, a word. Only hardcover. Yep. And um, he, doesn't... he buys a beer and drinks a shot of whiskey or drink a whiskey after every yep. time he comes. Yep. And um, basically it, it, it sort of spirals into some weirdness after that uh, in Mur- in like Murakami fashion. Basically these two guys come in and start, start a ruckus. The first weird thing that happens is these two guys come in, start kind of a fight with uh, Kino and the other guy's name. Uh, what's the other guy's name? I have it. I have it here. Come Kam- on. Kam- Kamita. Kamita. Yeah. Kamita. Kamita um and Kamita kind of does the like calm like fucking like you think he's gonna like pull out some like sick like martial arts moves and like beat them up but very calmly yeah that we don't know that that's what happened but basically he tells them to come outside with him and then 
mysteriously comes back in and says they're not going to be bothering you anymore. Yeah. We don't know what happens. Later, Kino starts to notice some weird stuff around the bar. There's a cat that used to live at the bar with him and the cat disappears. And there are these weird fucking snakes that he keeps seeing outside. Um, and yeah. Kamita says, uh, eventually says to him, hey, you got to go. Um, I'll let you know. He just basically says, you have to leave the bar, close it down, and I will contact you when it's safe to come back. Just go somewhere. Don't stay anywhere for, for too long of a time and send postcards with nothing on them to your mother or to your aunt. To your aunt. And um, then I'll let you know when it's safe to come back. Yeah. Very weird. Very he weird. Also, he also, the other character he meets is uh, a woman who's who comes to the bar. Mm-hmm. And then at one point, they're like alone in the bar and she takes off like her dress and shows him her back and it's like covered in scars and stuff or weird marks. I think it's it implied that they're out, like cigarette burns, right? Oh, it says that. She says yeah. that they're cigarette burns and then they, they have like a sexual relationship for a little while. Yes. So it just turns into this like cd type sin city bar kind of yes yeah 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 sex with the, the female customer who who had previously been coming in with this kind of like beatnik like goatee type kind of like dude and yeah. then she doesn't come in with him one night and then they have sex and then she just kind of starts coming in with him again <laughs> yeah and so anyway he he leaves he, he ends up leaving the bar and going and just sort of on the run almost from what he has no idea what and um that's kind of how it ends he's we don't on find he, out we don't find out what he's what running it is, from what he's yeah. running from or or what and he never goes back to the bar the, the the end of the book is him holed up in a hotel room with some it's what's implied to be like a mysterious entity like banging on his window and him kind of hiding under the sheets and that's the end of the story yeah i mean this one well, you said it was your favorite one so far, right? By a lot, so I think By a so lot. far, yeah. I still think the last one was my favorite so mm. far. Um, this one was almost like too open ended for me. Ah, uh. it was like I don't know. There, there were so many unanswered questions that, that didn't get, you didn't get a lot of information from a lot of the details that I, I I was kind of left like I I don't even know where to begin analyzing this one. I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff you can analyze and think about and draw lines to definitely but it was very very open-ended and the metaphors are very unclear yes yeah Uh, i I agree and uh, everything everything you just said is why i love it so much (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) i i I, uh yeah i definitely like i I think i like this one the most so far It, it it also just is for me and i've met we've talked about this before but for me I've been, I've never, like I said, I haven't I'm read very little Murakami before. And all I ever heard was, oh, he's so weird. He's so like out there. So like magical realism, da, 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 da. And a lot of the stories in this book are not that at all. The first, yeah. the first two are essentially have none of that. And then there's a little bit in like the third and fourth ones. Mm-hmm. And then this one, I felt like really delivered for me in terms of like my expectations for like a weird fucking Murakami story yeah and and i so it was satisfying for me as a reader in that sense at least you know Mm -hmm. uh but i agree with you there's really no uh not a lot of answers not a lot of like clarity i mean you know essentially none we don't really understand any (laughs) any of what's going on we don't know who kamita is we don't know why you know because the way kamita talks about it he kind of comes in one day and just kind of says uh you gotta go this bar is basically like this bar is polluted or there's like something wrong he, i think he says there's something missing right yeah that that moment i actually those couple pages where he talks about it and then um what's his name kino asks him about the snakes too and he yeah. like doesn't answer him it that is like th- that passage and the two pages that this comes comes up is the reason why i like mirakami so much though is that like uh, a story of his can be so grounded and then something feels that feels like a dream happening in reality happens. Yeah. And that, that whole interaction and dialogue between them felt like a dream world interaction. Did you, do you want to read it? Do you have it marked? I have it. I don't have it marked. Okay. Actually. So this is kind of when Kamita tells him he's got to close the bar. 
What page is that? It's 173 to 174. Okay. One night, just before 10, Kamita appeared. He had a beer followed by his usual double white label and ate a stuffed cabbage dish. It was unusual for him to come by so late and stay so long. Occasionally, he glanced up from his reading to stare at the wall in front of him as if pondering something. As closing time approached, he remained until he was the last customer. Mr. Kino, Kamita said rather formally after he'd paid his bill, I find it very regrettable that it's come to this. <laughs> this is like basically <laughs> the first words they've ever spoken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they talked like one other time. Uh, come to this, Kino repeated, that you'll have to close the bar, even if only temporarily. Kino stared at Kamita, not knowing how to respond. Close the bar? Kamita glanced around the deserted bar, then turned back to Kino. You haven't quite, quite grasped what I'm saying, have you? I don't think I have. I really liked this bar a lot, Kamita said, as, I, as if confiding in him. It was quiet, so I could read, and I enjoyed the music. I was very happy when you opened the bar here. Unfortunately, there are some things missing. Missing, Kino said. He had no idea what this could mean. All he could picture was a teacup with a tiny chip in its rim. The gray cat won't be coming back, Kamita said, for the time being at least. Because this place is missing something? Kamita didn't reply. Kino followed Kamita's gaze and looked carefully around the bar but saw nothing out of the ordinary. He did though get a sense that the place felt emptier than ever, lacking vitality and color, something beyond the usual just closed for the night feeling. Kamita spoke up. Mr. Kino, you're not the type who would willingly do something wrong. I know that very well. But there are times in this world when it's not, it's not enough to, to just not do the wrong thing. Some people use that blank space as a kind of loophole. Do you understand what I'm saying? Kino didn't understand. <laughs> 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 and it, 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 there's a little more to the dialogue there, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't really add anything, right? You, like you said, he asked him about the snakes. Um, he tells him that he needs to go away and as if he sort of has to hide from something or run from something. Um, and then the, it, the other kind of funny thing is that Kino just kind of does it. He just like this guy, he doesn't know who did, gives him no details. He's like, okay. Yeah. It's very strange. Um, and the, uh, another detail that comes out is that uh, Kami Kamita was actually sent there by Kino's aunt to keep an eye on him. Right. And that's totally, that was a very strange detail that is unexplained as well. Yes. It's like she knew um i don't know something was not gonna go right at the bar but yes. it, it's it's really weird that she would think that though and it's also weird that kamita is kind of like implied that he could be in yakuza, yakuza yeah which that comes like, up what? a couple times with a couple yeah. characters yeah it's interesting because it's sort of like yeah you're there's the there's that sort of hint in in a couple places about various characters being potential yakuza or, or gang members or, or whatever, but it, it's, it's, you know, and there is kind of that like mafia feel to that, that, that conversation, like, Hey, you need, you might, you might want to take a trip for a little while, buddy. So, yeah. so things can settle down around here or whatever, but it takes on a much more kind of like spiritual vibe. It's much more kind of like, you know, um, obscure and occult almost with the snakes like literally circling the bar and literally like taking up residence around the bar and he's you know obviously like there's all sorts of like mafia related like oh there's snakes in the grass and like there's terms like that that we use and so it's interesting yeah. that there's kind of like these metaphors and phrases that we associate with actual and and you know and the, the vibe with like actual mafia movies actual kind of mafia stories um, yeah, but it's literal in this one, and it's like literal snakes in the literal grass, and like, yeah, it, you know. So I just thought I, I thought that was a yeah, you're right. I thought it was an interesting detail, the yakuza thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that the snakes and the yakuza type characters are. It's it's an interesting story because I feel like they're used as a tool to talk about Kino's psyche at, mm -hmm. at, in the, his given state. Um. We're we're reading Killer Combinatory right now. That's not a spoiler. Finished it yesterday. Last time. Nice. But there's a line in there that um because the, the main character of that story is like in a very similar spot. Like he his wife left him, or yeah, was cheating on him. But there's a line in there that talks about how that main character kind of feels like a piece of driftwood. And um just kind of unaware of how terrible 
he actually is feeling at the given moment is just kind of like floating and surviving and i think that that's kind of the point of this story too or like the emotional message that's supposed to resonate with you is that like uh kino is in an emotional state but he's not um really facing it and i think the snakes are like crawling into his world and i also think that the snakes represent these sort of people that are crawling into his world as well yeah that he doesn't necessarily want in his life yeah i think that's right and i think that you know yeah because i think that the thrust of the story and i actually think that there's a, a couple links with killing Combinatore in this story um just like just like small things like descriptions or the the um like retirement home where his aunt goes to live is in the same area and has some similar features to the one that one of the main characters from Killing Commendatore lives in, um, which I thought was an interesting little Marvel Cinematic Universe touch. Um, But but yeah, the the, the, the Murakami first, right? So I think that, I think that, you know, um, the story for me was about Kino coming to terms with the fact that him, his wife cheating on him and, and the, the dissolution of his marriage affected him more than he it was wanted to admit that it did, or it affected him more than he was willing to show that it did. And get, just kind of coming to grips with that sort of grief, that sort of, you know, you know, sadness. Yeah. I think it's a thing that Murakami explores a lot, like not just in um, Killing Combinatory, but I feel like that's explored a lot in a lot of the stories in this book too yeah i think it's like a just a problem he's fascinated with and i think that's one reason why i like mirakami too i'm that kind of like de- delayed reaction type emotional person where i do kind of become like a driftwood type human being where you can't really i don't even know if i'm bad or good at, the, at in those moments or whatever but you know things sink in later i was like oh i feel like shit for six months <laughs> 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 right, right oh I, right. yeah well because you b- backed it up so much you 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 know stuffed yeah. it down that when it comes out it's even more extreme and painful yeah i think i think that's a, an issue probably a lot of people have mm-hmm. yeah I, I think it's interesting the way that the, the sort of the story kind of ends like uh or or the, the way that it kind of wraps up because so kamita tells him hey, you, you have to send your aunt these postcards, right, from wherever you are, and mm-hmm. you can never write anything on them. You can't write anything on them, just stamp them from your location, mail them. Mm-hmm. Kino breaks that rule, right? He writes something on one of the postcards at, at one point. He just says, yeah. you know, <laughs> just some dumb thing, like, how are you? I'm doing okay, hope to visit, blah, blah, blah. Signed Kino. Signed like, Kino. It was like the most important part of this too is don't sign your name. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is this, and this is like, again, kind of like a mafia thing. Like they yeah. can't know where you are. They can't see your handwriting or your signature. Just, you got to keep moving. You got to go from place to place. And he breaks that rule. And then ultimately he is found by some kind of entity that we don't know what yeah. it is. And, and, you know, but like he's, the window but it's very creepy the way it's described because the window that this thing is tapping on is like on the like seventh story of a building like flat up or something and it's so it's it's this kind of eerie like i don't know description of this creepy thing outside his window trying to get in but like even that is kind of like a mafia description right you can't let them know where they are you can't sign your name and he breaks the rule and then he's he's found and so it's sort of interesting that like it, it, it feels like he's obviously he's running sort of from his own feelings, from his own memories, which is another connection with Killing Commendatore, especially in that, that the, the, the main weird section in that book is all about memory and like the power of memory and the importance of like recalling things. And that's kind of yeah. what gets the main character in that story through a difficult section. And at one point, you know, um, Kino is sort of under his covers in the bed while this thing is trying to get into his room and he's running through all these memories of his life and that's like sort of what what's keeping him grounded and at one point you know Kamita has says to him you know memories can be helpful <laughs> and that like you know so I think that's a theme here too yeah 
Yeah, I think uh, I, I read this story twice because I was I was kind of like I, I needed to pick up on a little bit more of the details. And the second time around, I thought, you know, the the entity or whatever that's that comes and visits him, that's like terrorizing him at the end, like thinking about it in a grounded way. It's like, yeah, if the mob was after him and I was thinking the two guys that were you know, lost at the bar that Kamita potentially murdered or whatever. Yeah. That that would be like the driving force of this mob like problem, I suppose. But the entity is such like a, a magical monster like force um, that it becomes something else besides a grounded story. And I yeah. think that's, uh, you know, this story in particular has a lot of the strengths that Murakami is known for. And I think yeah. one of them is like using a, a grounded issue or problem or you know what am i what, what am i thinking for thinking of i don't know you, you kind of understand what i'm saying but like using using something grounded and elevating it to something magical yes magical realism <laughs> but it, really. like, <laughs> it, it uh it can like be uh, a, we, lot a term that effective. we just made up now yeah just, wow. we made it up i can't believe no one's ever said that before these dum-dums they don't know perfectly. what they're talking about <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's like uh, it it can really amplify the emotional state of the character and it makes you maybe feel something that he's feeling in the story or she in a more personal way. Um, yeah, definitely. The um, I just want to read the section where the thing starts tapping. So this is like right after he this is on uh, 180 to 181. This is w- right after he sends the postcard that he signed <laughs> stupidly. When he awoke, the clock next to his bed showed 2.15. Someone was knocking on his door. Not a loud knock, but a firm, compact sound, like that of a skilled carpenter pounding a nail. And whoever it was doing the knocking knew that the sound was reaching Kino's ears. The sound dragged Kino out of a deep sleep until his consciousness was thoroughly, even cruelly clear. Kino knew who was knocking. The knocking wanted him to get out of bed and open the door, forcefully, persistently. The person didn't have the strength to open the door from the outside. The door had to be opened by Kino's own hand from the inside. It struck him that this visit was exactly what he'd been hoping for, yet at the same time what he'd been fearing above all. The ambiguous ambiguity was precisely this, holding on to an empty space between two extremes. You were hurt a little, weren't you? His wife had asked. I'm a human after all, I was hurt, he'd replied. But that wasn't true, half of it at least was a lie. I wasn't hurt enough when I should have been, Kino admitted to himself. When I should have felt real pain, I stifled it. I didn't want to take it on, so I avoided facing up to it, which is why my heart is so empty now. The snakes have grabbed that spot and are trying to hide their coldly beating hearts there. Love yeah, it. I, I, uh, you can't see it because my bookshelf is so big. But I, I, uh, that was like my favorite paragraph is that last one you just read. I yeah. It clearly states, you know, potentially what is happening. Yeah. Especially in his mind, though. It's like the, the snakes are crawling in there. And it's that tension between, you know, being the being the person who shuts yourself off in the first place and then also being the only person who's ever able to open that door again. Like no one can do yeah. it for you, right? The, all that all that can ever happen is that someone can fucking knock knock knock, but you you have to you have to unlock it ultimately. Yeah, or else you fall into like a like a loophole, which is what Camille said earlier in, in that passage you read. Yes. Yeah. Scary, good, really scary. It there's the it, 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 it the tapping thing is actually creepy. Like uh, this description legitimately creeped me out. This is like the next page because this goes on for like uh, you know days, right? Like he'll it'll it comes every night, right, and starts tapping for a couple days, right? Um. Okay, let's see here. He wasn't sure. This is on the next page. He wasn't sure how much time had passed, but he realized that the knocking had stopped. The room was as hushed as the far side of the moon. Still, Kino remained under the covers. He had to be on his guard. He stayed as quiet as he could, perked up his ears, trying to catch a hint of something ominous in the silence. The being outside his door wouldn't give up that easily. It was in no hurry. The moon wasn't out. Only the withered constellations darkly dotted the sky. The world belonged for a while longer to those other beings. They had many different methods. They could get what they wanted in all kinds of ways. The roots of darkness could spread everywhere beneath the earth, patiently taking their time, searching out weak points. They could break apart the most solid rock. Finally, Kino, as Kino had expected, the knocks began once more, but this time they came from another direction, much closer than before. Whoever was knocking was right outside the window by his bed, 
clinging to the sheer wall of the building, eight stories up, face pressed against the window, tap, tap, tapping on the rain streaked glass. He couldn't picture it in any other way. So oh, creepy. I just got, I just I mean, got chills, it's literally, I got chills again. literally yeah. right now. Oh. It's so creepy. I hate I it. I mean, it, it reminds me of uh, the, tw the Twilight Zone episode with that teddy gear guy, which still scares me too, but it's the same kind yes. of idea, just like, or it reminds something... me of that creepy anime. There's that creepy manga meme picture of the guy outside the window. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's also scary. Let me see if I can find the picture. Y'all you, you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. I don't know what it's from, but uh, it's from it's it's from like a manga uh, manga guy outside window. <laughs> creepy. Now, we're on video now, so we can show people our uh, the pictures we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's like, it's a meme. Yeah, this one, this one. I don't know what this is from, but this, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that's a, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I pictured when he was describing that. Except something potentially even more demonic and, and inhuman. Um, I also just, you know, on the non-creepy, non-thematic side, I just love the vibe of this story. Like him just describing the bar as this like chill, like he doesn't advertise it. He just puts up a sign and like waits for people to come. And like, it's yeah. like weeks before the first any customers show up and he's just in there just like vibing and playing jazz records. And it just seems so, I was like, I, I want to go to this bar. <laughs> I think you like this one so much because it's like Murakami Simonon. Murakami Simonon. Why do you, wait, Mur okay, why do you say that? How do you say that connection? Well, because uh, there's a little bit of that, you know, noir type feel, I would say, which isn't usually common in Murakami stories. Like, mm, that's interesting. Th the first like third of this, I was like, this feels like a Simonon story to me, written in the way in uh, Murakami's voice. It was cool. Plus the the Yakuza, like the book that we read for our last episode, Those Leonardo words. Shasha's Day of oh, the Owl, which isn't out yet, is it? But not out. Not out yet. But yeah, spoilers, spoilers, which is about the mafia. It's actually about the mafia. Yeah. Um, but I love some of that writing early on in this story, just, just just describing the bar, describing the like kind of back alley where it is and just the the vibe inside. I, I, I thought the, the writing in this story I really enjoyed. Yeah, definitely. Um, along with the weirdness and the theme. I don't know this one. I thought I, this one kind of stuck with me for a couple of days after I finished it. What do you think of the willow tree? Yeah. Um, I don't I know. Of, I don't know either. I'm trying to find a passage with it. But he it's, kind of he kind of views a, this willow tree as like a safe haven, I would which say. Which is sort of out. It's right outside. It's like outside the bar, right? Yeah. Um, there's like a weird, there's like a little like oasis of, of green and trees and stuff in next to the bar. But that's and, also where the snakes start invading also. Right. I mean, I think it was just kind of one of those, because that was another one of these things that he kind of appeals to as like a grounding memory as he's trying to kind of push away the, 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 the mysterious visitor and kind of keep himself grounded. He thinks about, that's one, the tree is one of the things that he thinks about. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't have a, uh, I mean, and the description of it is beautiful there, right? It's, this is him remembering the tree as he's trying to kind of, or wait, is this, this is from his, this is from his, okay, no, so the, the tree's not outside the bar. This is from his home, his old house, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so this is when he's trying to kind of hide from the, the entity outside the door. A sudden thought struck Kino that Kamita was somehow connected with the old willow tree in the front yard. That tree had protected him and his little house he didn't grasp how this made sense exactly, but once the thought took hold of him, things fell into place. Kino pictured the limbs of the tree covered in green, sagging heavily down, nearly to the ground. In summer, they provided cool shade to the yard. On rainy days, gold droplets glistened on their soft branches. On windless days, the branches were sunk in deep, quiet thought. On windy days, they swayed like a restless heart. Tiny, blur tiny birds flew over, screeching at one another alighting neatly on the thin, supple branches only to take off again. For a moment, after they flew away, the branches swayed back and forth delightfully. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful writing. Yeah. But I think it's interesting, this, this, like, okay, this is another connection I, that I see with Killing Commendatore is the sort of, like, because in that story, there's a couple instances 
where inanimate objects serve as like protective like talismans that people can like hide behind or they make them like in, in like invulnerable to harm or whatever like there's the clothes in the closet and then there's a little penguin charm and then there's a couple other things and so this seems like in line with that sort of thing as well yeah i think it adds to some sort of i mean i don't know about japanese uh, religion at all but there's mm. a lot of like spiritual elements that i think go over my head in a lot of murakami stories but yeah. i don't even think you like need to be incredibly knowledgeable about them to to get a sense of what is being said yeah i think you're probably right yeah and there's i mean there's so much spiritual writing in a lot of mirakami's stories but i i've read a few of his novels at this point and i still he did he never like makes a blatant claim what he believes he mostly just like uses this knowledge he has about i don't know japanese religious history or because they have I forget. I'm so stupid. I forgot what the main religious, you know, what made the main religion in Japan. Well, is, so there's like, there's like kind of Shinto, worship, like, I know, which is, I, I don't know if that's the main one. But um, they, they kind of believe that like objects and things have like a spirit within them. Yeah. So it's like a. Okay. Know. So here's the Wikipedia <laughs> definition that I just looked up. So this is my, I don't know if this helps you or not. Shinto is a religion which originated in Japan, classified as an East Asian religion by scholars of religion. Its practitioners often regard it as Japan's indigenous religion and as a nature religion. Yeah. And I think that that fits with kind of some of Murakami's stuff, at least that goofy, very short description. Yeah, I, t I think it totally does. But he, you know, dives so deeply and beautifully into that idea that, I don't know, I feel like anyone can get something out of it. And it yeah. becomes something more and it becomes like, something that is definitely not silly it takes no. on something very real and you can i don't know for me i get a lot of emotions from it oh definitely <laughs> this story this story like i said it was very affecting to me the yeah. the whole thing and the ending and it stuck with me for a while um so okay wait so are we saying because it's spiritual and there's yakuza that we could this story is the spiritual gangster or how about Tokyo Ghosts? That's a graphic novel that you probably Tokyo Ghosts. Heard of. Tokyo Ghosts. <laughs> I've never heard of it, but that sounds that sounds that that would be an equally apt description. Um, and yeah, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. All right, is this going to break the uh, four point markings for you? We'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Okay. In about five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anything else? Any any passages you wanted to read? Any um, any final thoughts? I underlined two passages, and you read both of the ones. Okay. Underlined, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, great minds. Great minds. Yeah. Uh, the end is pretty cool. I think I want to read the ending. Do it. Just the last. Uh, uh, the willow branches swayed in the early summer breeze. In a small dark room somewhere inside Kino, a warm hand was reaching out to him. Eyes shut, he felt that hand on his soft and substantial he'd forgotten this had been apart from it for, for far too long yes i am hurt very very deeply he said to the, he said this to himself and he wept in that dark still room all the white the rain did not let him sleep all the while the rain did not let him sleep drenching the world in a cold chill i thought that was a fucking beautiful it's great. ending it's and great I, I mean the line in a small dark room somewhere inside Kino, a warm hand was reaching out to him. That's yeah. like both creepy, but it's like a warm hand. It's not to me. It wasn't like the monster's hand. It was like some other thing has entered into the story and it's inside him. And it's, it's the like, sort of memory of, of emotion again, maybe. Right. It's like feeling feeling hu human again. Yeah. And I think right. it's it's also that sort of like that sense of um, interior space. That's another big thing in Murakami too. Like in Killing Commendatory, that's another, like, it just makes me think of the pit and like the various ways the pit functions as a metaphor in that story. Um, so that's spoilers for when we talk about that, but. We just want to talk about it so bad. <laughs> itching, we're itching too. <laughs> we are. Um, but, uh, but yes, I think, yeah, the ending is great. And it, it just speaks to, again, right? Like th there's no there's no final final answer. I almost said final solution, which is not a phrase you, you should say. No. Uh, <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's no concrete answer. There's no like simple 
simple way out, right? It's this constant tension between wanting to keep the pain away, but also like wanting to maintain the things that, that, that make us human. Um, and I think that that's kind of what Kino is still struggling with at the end of the story. He finally does admit that he was hurt so badly, but we also get the feeling that it's kind of too late in some ways. Yeah, which is a dark thought. I hope the best for him. Same. <laughs> I, hope, I hope he turns the bar like back into a coffee shop or something. And No, I, I think know. you should keep it a bar, dude. That bar sounds tight. Yeah, but the snakes are going to come back. Just, it's not, it, the problem wasn't that it was a bar. Well, it, it attracted a certain crowd. Yeah, that, that girl, the, the girl, that couple was very strange and dark. Yeah. Well, and the two, you know, and the two wise, the wise guys. <laughs> the, hey, you fucking wise guys. <laughs> I was kind of picturing that. And I, I kind of p- pictured uh, Kamita looking like uh, Nicolas Cage. Ooh, oh, dude, like, I could see that actually. <laughs> like a young Nicolas Cage. I could see that. Which made uh, me laugh a little too much. But... <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Kamita. Nicholas Kamita. Yeah. Um, Good story. Yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe my rating is boosted. I, I think I said earlier, I don't know. No, I, I think the last story is still my favorite. This one's still good, though. I forget the, the last right, story, what rating I gave it. But. Let's do let's do some ratings, then. Do you want me to go first? Okay. Yeah. The answer is yes, dude. I love this story. Over four, definitely. Oh. This is like a this, this is like a 4.18 for me. Oh. Almost a, maybe a 4.18, 4.18. Wow. Loved it. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. It, it made me feel feels. It made me, it creeped me out. I was, I was genuinely goosebump creeped out at points. And yeah. then it gave me also like warm, cozy, like ASMR vibes at points. <laughs> I love, dude, you know, you know, I love these videos, just these videos that are just these like, like 10 hour videos of like animated rain falling on windows oh i like them too with like yeah. candles crackling and shit and and, or, and like faint jazz music playing that i put that on to go to sleep every fucking night i love it so good. and it gave I, me that it gave good. me it gave me those vibes at the beginning and then it creeped me out and then it made me sad and made me feel feelings and it stuck <laughs> with me i loved it it was great <laughs> it made me feel feelings <laughs> yeah what more what more can you ask for at when reading exactly a little, a little story um I think I'm going to give it like a 3.95, nice. which is a weird cop out. I'm, I should just give it a four. I'm going to give it a four, which I just realized that's my highest score for sure. So what am I talking about? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess this was my favorite story. There it is. On record. Wow. Put Mark it down. Mark it. People out there <laughs> keeping tabs, mark it down. And write fool in parentheses. <laughs> you absolute idiot. You drooling <laughs> hog. <laughs> you drooling took the words hog out of my ball. mouth. Yeah, I could tell you like <laughs> you moron. You absolute dumb dumb. Stinky moron. Well, anything else? What are we reading? What's no. the next story? Samsa in love. And then the last story is called Men Without Women. Oh, that's yeah. Okay, that's the one other thing I wanted to say about the story that we've talked about about every other story. Is that this one was was sort of, I thought, the most directly addressing that theme of men without women. Because yeah. it's a man sort of dealing with, like, all the other stories. And, and this one was more about, like, most of the characters are men, right? His ex-wife comes in at one point, and then there's the aunt. Well, then there's the woman at the bar. And the woman at the bar. Cigarette burns. Um, but this one, I thought, was most explicitly about that theme because we've kind of been talking about about all the other stories not the last one not um uh uh uh, shahrazad but all of the others are kind of more about these like bromances almost and this one this one was not really about that like i I thought it might be at first because it describes keen uh kamita coming into the bar and kino talking to him but this one I thought was most kind of like on the on the theme that I was kind of expecting from some of these stories. Yeah, I think so. Especially with the lack of there being a bromance. Really yeah. Amplified the the loneliness that the Kino had. Right. So, yeah, I would say you're right. Nice. And I would also say that Killing Commendatory could like be called Men Without Men Without Man Without Woman. But just and big painting. and long, the long book. 
big long book and here's a painting also there's uh, a bromance in that one kind of there is a bromance yeah, yeah. i mean th- yeah that book really fits the, a, along i mean they're kind of written within the same couple of years i think i think mm-hmm. killing him in a tour was 2017 i think this, this one is yeah i think that's right 2018 in yep so he had something on his mind I mean, some of these stories were written a lot earlier than that, but this collection was published first in 20, 2017. Oh, 2017, yeah. Let me look at Americani, or look at, look at Americani right now. <laughs> killing commendatory. So, yeah. I'm excited to finish these, uh, this book. This has, been, this has been great. And then we're going to move oh, on yeah. to some others. Killing commendatory was 2018. I just had to Okay, switch. perfect. So, yeah, but so it makes sense in some ways, right? It kind of fits... All, yeah. That 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 if he wanted to make this collection really long, that book could have just been in this collection. <laughs> this massive book. He should just make all of his books into one book. Just a short spine. story collection that's just like a seven hundred page novel and like three ten page short stories. It's like it's like it, it would you'd go to the bookstore and it'd be like buying one of those like twenty foot long subs so you get just huge. I love it. Oh, it's so good. Uh, well until next time right yeah two more to go i'm excited and then we're moving on to the elephant vanishes the elephant vanishes yeah that's gonna be fun mm-hmm. and then uh killing commendatory in a week potentially or well we'll see yeah all right any final thoughts paul good book good story good story a nice a book a nice tale uh yep. go subscribe to our patreon if you like this video if you really like it i mean if you just like it it's fine then thumbs up just, the video and subscribe like to the it. youtube channel that's free yeah the twitter is also like it, free go ahead and like it but yeah if you really liked it like it and subscribe and then if you really really like it then go then like it subscribe and go subscribe to our patreon yes because we want to get to the point where we can um you know have more people subscribe to that that's that, yeah that is yeah i, I love that yeah, we do want to get to that point just we just become professional dum-dums yeah professional that's, book dum-dums that's the dream so thank you for watching youtube take it easy we'll see you next time this has been gabe and paul we love Bye, you youtube